thank you for joining us for the annual Patricia Roberts Harris lecture. Um, this is the first time in many years that we brought the lecture back to Howard University. Um, so when the Patricia Roberts Harris Fellowship began back in 1990, Eleanor Holmes Norton was actually our inaugural speaker. So she'll be back here today to um, deliver remarks after 32 years. So with the relaunch of the program, it's appropriate that she be the person to do that. Um, so again, just a warm welcome to have you all here. And um, we're going to have a little bit of a, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't introduce myself to that. My name is Jerome Haysworth, the second. Um, I am the program manager for the Patricia Roberts Harris Fellowship. Um, I've been in this role for about uh, seven months. Um, I'm a Howard alum and the Ralph Bunch International Affairs Center where the fellowship is administered um, is very near and dear to me. Um, the Bunch Center was instrumental in helping me to have an internship abroad. When I was a student, I interned at the U.S. Embassy in the Dominican Republic. Um, and did some part-time work as well as the State Department. So, um, without further ado, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about how we altered the program a little bit. So, uh, Tania Hope will be giving the closing remarks. And next, we'll have Jennifer Early to, um, to give us remarks as well about the program's history and some information about Patricia Ronald Harris herself. Thank you so much. as a living memorial to a Howard University alumna, professor, and being known for her trailblazing public service career. Patricia Roberts Harris was a 1945 summa cum laude graduate of Howard's College of Liberal Arts, whose many markers of achievement included serving as a ambassador to a member and holding two cabinet posts. Secretary of the U.S. Department of Health, Education, and Welfare, and Secretary of the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. Patricia Roberts Harris had an unwavering commitment to social justice and public service. She understood her platform and the responsibility she carried when or if placed into a position of privilege and power. She used her education as a doorway to, in order to achieve change never wavering from her commitment to excellence in truth and service. The program at Howard bearing her name, which grew out of the request she made from the university, was established in October 1987. <coughs> its purpose was twofold, to complement the university's course offerings in areas related to public policy and to encourage students to consider careers in public service. One key feature of the program includes an annual lecture focusing on a major issue or issues of national and international concern. And in addition, the Harris program sponsors internships for Howard University students. These internships provide stipends, enabling undergraduate, graduate, and professional students like me an opportunity to get first-hand introduction introductions to what public service careers can tell by working in Congress, which I do, <laughs> in federal and district Columbia agencies, and in private organizations concerned with public policy issues, both domestic and abroad. On top of that, fellows are um, placed with a mentor, and we engage in professional development workshops. 
Um, again, it was such an honor to be a PRH fellow. My experience was very broad, and I learned so much. Um, I encourage any of you all to apply next year um, if you have the opportunity to do so. And if you're interested in public affairs, service, um, whether that be domestic or international, this is an amazing, amazing opportunity. Thank you.
but this is the first time we've been able to have a lecture because pandemic and all things. So we're really excited to be able to kick this off again. Um, and I'm also excited to, to be able to grow the program uh, with the recent uh, award that we received from the Carnegie Corporation of New York that will allow us to bifurcate the program and offer a very specific uh, international affairs track that will provide stipends for students to go um, do an internship abroad, marrying study abroad, education abroad with an internship in another country. So we're really, really excited about that. And for those of you who have not applied to PRH yet, I hope that this will incentivize you to consider it and apply next year. Um, with that, I think that we are close to having a congresswoman here. So I'm going to stop talking and thank you all again for coming and we'll be with you momentarily. You don't know. We're in the middle of International Education Week, so every year the Department of Education and the Department of State have declared this week International Education Week. It's usually the second week of November. And um, so we always plan a lot of activities already this week. On Monday, we celebrated the anniversaries of our fellowship, other, our other fellowship programs, the Rainbow Pickering and Payne Fellowships. Are you all familiar with those fellowship programs? Okay, so we celebrated the 10th anniversary of the Payne Fellowship, which is for U.S. Uh, Agency for International Development, the 20th anniversary of the Wrangell Fellowship, and the 30th anniversary of the Pickering Fellowship, which are both uh, efforts to diversify the foreign service of the State Department. Um, we celebrate all those anniversaries on Monday. Um, yesterday, we took a embassy walk to the Embassy of Ghana. For those of you who are not familiar with our embassy walks, we started embassy walks last year um, when we returned to campus after the pandemic and we were looking for ways to do programming that didn't require us to be inside all the time. And so we started walking to embassies that are near campus and we went to the Embassy of India first. Um, we did go inside the Embassy of India and were treated to some lovely refreshments and lots of gifts that were quite heavy to carry home, but nevertheless, they were great. Um, books on Gandhi and so forth. And then we went to the Embassy of Colombia, we went to the Embassy of Ireland, and then we went to the Embassy of Botswana. And um, this semester, we went to the Embassy of Singapore a couple of weeks ago, and yesterday we did the Embassy of Ghana. So if you don't follow us on social media yet, I, think I encourage you to do so, so that you can join us on our next Embassy Walk. We probably won't do any more this semester because it's getting a little chilly. Thanksgiving is next week, so, but next spring, we'll certainly try to start that again, and we'll try to keep them closer to campus. Uh, Ghana and Singapore are over by the law school, so we'll take the shuttle a little bit to the law school and walk from there. But it's a great way to get exercise, fresh air, and meet with um, embassy staff, and we, we met with the ambassador of Ghana yesterday, we had two hours with the ambassador of Singapore the other day, and everyone is trying to figure out how they can get to these places so um, we did that and then this is our activity for Wednesday tomorrow we're having uh, sessions on study abroad where is that oh um, law call tabling 2 to 3 30 and 4 p.m. information center down in bunch session down in bunch thank you very much and we are working really hard to get you all back out into the world if you haven't checked out our hashtag, Study Abroad So Black, please do that. You go to that hashtag on Instagram. What you will see are beautiful images of mostly Howard University students, although we share the hashtag and there are some other folks in there as well. But beautiful people that look like us out in the world being fabulous and having a, a very impactful time abroad. So. Um, they're great, great photos um, at hashtag study bus of black. And then um, on Friday, we've partnered with the American Mandarin Society for two panels 
taking place in the undergraduate library multi-purpose room from 10 to 12, one panel on US-China policy and another panel on uh, careers with China. But the, the interesting angle of this is that all of the panelists are part of their African American China Fellows Program. So they're all African Americans that work on China, China policy, China issues, etc. So that's a little bit of a different take on many of the events around town that have to do with China. So I do hope that you will uh, join us on Friday morning. Um, and, and participate in all of the activities that we have going on. This is just International Education Week. We packed a lot of stuff into this week, but we do stuff all the time. Again, so if you um, follow us on social media, sign up for our newsletter, you will not miss any of the things that we have going on. And we have a lot of things going on that, that pop up at last minute because we're in Washington, D.C., and people call us all the time, and they're like, oh, we're gonna be in D.C because we're gonna go meet with people on the Hill or we're gonna we have a meeting at the White House or what have you and we'd love to come to Howard. And so then, you know, the next day we have an event. So I mean now I'm really gonna stop talking because she's really <laughs> Thank you. probably going to talk about it. I am a lifelong DC resident and this is my congresswoman and she is the greatest advocate for DC statehood. And so if you all don't know, the residents of this city do not have representation in Congress and that is a very big problem, especially as we talk about democracy. Anybody go to the democracy summit yesterday? No? It was amazing. What is it? Oh, the Democracy Summit with the Center for Journalism and Democracy, Nicole Hannah Jones Center, had a fantastic event. And if it is, I think it's available um, probably on the YouTube channel or something, you can watch all of the panels from yesterday, which literally were mind blowing. I would definitely encourage you all to check that out as we have these conversations about democracy. And keep in mind that Washington, D.C was not actually, it was interesting, they said yesterday the United States was not a democracy until 1965, the 1965 Voting Rights Act. However, I would argue it's still not a democracy because 700,000 residents of Washington, D.C. do not have representation in the U.S. Congress, so I'm sure she'll touch on that. That's just my blood on that. On that okay, I'm going to step off because anyhow, you know, let's get this Thank you. <laughs> As the inaugural speaker for the Patricia Roberts Holmes Lecture in 1990, Congresswoman Eleanor Holmes Norton was instrumental in inspiring the first cohort of PRH fellows as they embarked on careers in public service, both domestically and internationally. With the expansion of the program and the relaunch of the annual lecture, it is befitting that the Congresswoman address the Howard University community again as you've heard, this fellowship and this lecture is named after the Honorable Patricia Roberts Harris, a woman of many firsts and alumna of Howard University. She was the first black woman to serve the country as an ambassador, the first black woman to become the dean of a law school, and the first woman to serve in a presidential cabinet as Secretary of Housing and Urban Development in the cabinet of President Jimmy Carter. Congresswoman Eleanor Holmes Norton needs no introduction. A native of Washington, D.C. and long-serving representative for the District of Columbia, Representative Holmes Norton has championed voting rights for D.C. citizens, women's rights and empowerment, and the importance of enfranchisement of underserved communities. As democracy has been increasingly under attack in this country and internationally, we're certainly appreciative of her advocacy for voting rights. As we congratulate her for her most recent 
election victory, please join me in welcoming Representative Eleanor Homeschool. Introduction. I am very pleased to be back giving the Harris Lecture 32 years after I gave the inaugural lecture in 1990, the same year I was first elected to Congress. While much has changed in that time, the political rights of District of Columbia residents unfortunately have not. I would like to focus today on statehood, voting rights, and home rule for the District of Columbia. As a third generation Washingtonian, the political rights of DC residents are deeply personal to me. They are part and parcel of Howard University, but are also a core democracy, civil rights, and racial justice issue. The struggle for civil uh, and human rights for all Americans has been the central theme of my professional life. My own family has lived in the District of Columbia since my great-grandfather, Richard Holmes, as a slave, walked away from a plantation in Virginia and made his way to D.C. almost 200 years ago. It was a walk to freedom, but not to citizenship. During law school and afterward, I was deeply involved in the civil rights movement. I was one of the founders of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, or SNCC as we called it, along with such important leaders as John Lewis. While I was a student, I went to Mississippi to fight for voting rights as part of SNCC. And I also helped organize the March on Washington. In, 19, in 1977, I was appointed by President Jimmy Carter to be the first female chair of the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. While there, I issued the first federal guidelines holding sexual harassment to be a violation of equal employment laws, later upheld by the United States Supreme Court. It is worth noting that I served in the Carter administration at the same time that Patricia Roberts Harris served his administration as Secretary of Housing and Urban <coughs> Development and then as Secretary of Health and Human Services. After serving in the Carter administration, I became a tenured professor of law at the Georgetown University Law Center. Finally, I was first elected to Congress in 1990. This country was founded on the principle of no taxation without representation and consent of the government. Yet DC residents are taxed without voting representation in Congress, cannot consent to the federal laws that govern them, and ultimately cannot consent to the local laws of government because Congress has final say on all District of Columbia matters. The U.S. is an anomaly. We are the only democratic con country that denies voting representation in the national legislature to the residents of its capital. There is only one political solution that would give D.C. residents voting representation in Congress and complete control over their local affairs. That solution is to make the District of Columbia a state. In 2020, the House of Representatives passed my bill to make D.C. a state, which was the first time in history either chamber of Congress had passed the D.C. statehood bill. The House passed it again in 2021. Before I discuss the politics of the bill, I would like to discuss its constitutionality. Some say D.C. can only be admitted as a state by constitutional amendment, which would require passage of two-thirds majority in the House and Senate and ratification by three-quarters of the states. They are wrong. 
It only takes a simple act of Congress. My D.C. statehood bill would establish the state of Washington Douglas Commonwealth. D.C., that, for us that D.C. stands for Frederick Douglas. The new state would consist of 66 of the 68 square miles of the present day District of Columbia, also known as the Federal District. The other two square miles would remain the Federal District and Congress would retain plenary authority over it. The admissions clause of the Constitution gives Congress the authority to admit new, new states. All it takes is an act of Congress and presidential signature. Congress has admitted 37 new states since the original 13. While the Constitution does not establish any prerequisites for new states, Congress generally has considered three population and resources, support for statehood, and commitment to democracy. The state of Washington Douglas Commonwealth would meet each. DC's population of almost 700,000 is larger than that of two states. DC pays more federal taxes per capita than any state and pays more federal taxes than 23 states. DC's gross domestic product is larger than 17 states. In 2016, 86% of DC residents voted for statehood. DC residents have been petitioning for voting represent representation in Congress and local autonomy for 220 years. Some argue that Maryland's consent would be necessary for DC to become a state because the admissions clause states that no new state shall be formed or erected within the jurisdiction of any other state. They argue because Maryland gave the land to the federal government to establish the federal district. If that land were instead used to create a new state, then Maryland, they argue, would have to consent because the new state would be, quote, formed uh, or erected within Maryland's jurisdiction, end quote. However, Maryland gave the land to DC in what is called fee simple absolute, meaning it gave it with no future or reversionary interest reserved in the land. The federal government could use or dispose of the land as it sees fit, and Congress can therefore create a new state from that land. The Maryland legislature to give over the land to the government said that the land would be, and I'm quoting, forever ceded and relinquished to the Congress and government of the United States in full and absolute right and exclusive jurisdiction. Indeed, Maryland property law has historically disfavored reversionary interests Therefore, Maryland's consent is not needed. The district clause of the Constitution gives Congress plenary, plenary authority over the federal district. The framers wanted an independent federal district so the federal government would not re rely on any state and so that no state would have too much influence over the federal government, which they felt would happen if the capital were in a state. The district clause also establishes a maximum size of the federal district, uh, 100 square miles. It does not establish a minimum size, nor a location for the federal district. If the framers wanted to establish a minimum size, they could have done so. Congress has twice reduced the size of the federal district. The first time was in 1791, less than a year after Virginia and Maryland ceded the land to establish the district. 
and less than four years after the Constitutional Convention. Indeed, it was the first Congress that voted to change the district's southern boundary. Congress next reduced the size of the federal district by 30 percent. That's an additional 30 percent in 1846. The reason Congress did this was to return the portion that originally belonged to Virginia, primarily what is now Arlington County and Alexandria. Southerners in Congress did this because they were afraid that a future Congress would limit the slave trade in D.C. and thought Virginia would not. If the continuation of slavery was a good enough reason in 1846 to shrink the federal district, surely the right to full and equal representation should be good enough today. Some argue that the Constitution establishes an implicit minimum size for the federal district because in their view the federal district has to be of sufficient size to protect itself and not be reliant on states. However, this argument not only ignores the text of the Constitution but also the history and current practice D.C. has all been, always been reliant on states for services and protection. For example, D.C.'s drinking water is produced in Virginia. D.C. does not generate any of its own electricity other than limited solar power. This is not unique to D.C. States often have services such as drinking water and electric come from other states. During inaugurations, thousands of police officers from states come to D.C. to help D.C. On January 6th, the D.C. Police Department, as well as the Maryland and Virginia Police and the National Guard, helped end the insurrection. Now, some argue that the 23rd Amendment prohibits D.C. statehood. That amendment allows the federal district to participate in the Electoral College, currently with three electoral votes. The statehood bill reduces the size of the federal district to two square miles, essentially the U.S. Capitol, the White House, and the Supreme Court and National Mall. There are only a handful of people who would live in what would be the reduced federal district, meaning those people would control those electoral votes. The bill repeals the Enabling Act for the 23rd Amendment, and I have no doubt that the 23rd Amendment itself would be repealed quickly, since neither party would know how the handful of people would vote who would be in that small federal district. However, even if it were not repealed, the 23rd Amendment does not establish a minimum size or location of the federal district in the same way that the district laws did not establish a minimum size or location for the federal district. While giving a handful of people electoral votes may not be good policy, it is not unconstitutional. Unfortunately, despite, despite being a matter of democratic rights, statehood has become a partisan issue. All House Democrats now support the D.C. statehood bill. All House Republicans oppose it. Forty-six Senate Democrats support it. Three Senate Democrats have not taken a position yet. And one Senate Democrat opposes D.C. statehood. All Senate Republicans appear opposed as well. While Republicans say the bill is, is unconstitutional, they may openly acknowledge they oppose it really for purely partisan reasons. Since most DC voters are registered Democrats, Republicans say, do not, say they do not want two new Democratic senators and a new Democratic House member. In a democracy, political rights should not be conditioned on party affiliation. 
Moral with things change. Some states that were admitted into the union have changed their political leanings over time. Republicans have also come up with some interesting other reasons to oppose D.C. statehood. During consideration of the bill, Republicans said D.C. should not be a state because it does not have car dealerships. Which, which by the way, it does. <laughs> or because it does not have mining or logging. I don't recall reading those requirements in the Constitution. These arguments are no more credit worthy than arguments people made against Texas admission, since it was previously a republic, or Alaska's or Hawaii's, because they weren't contiguous. We have made tremendous progress recently in our march to making D.C. the 51st state. As I noted, the House of Representatives has passed the bill twice. And we have a record number of supporters in the Senate. However, the bill does not have majority support in the Senate, not yet. And even if it did, Republicans would filibuster the bill. And it takes 60 votes to end a filibuster. It will either take a Democratic supermajority in the Senate or abolishing the filibuster to pass the bill there. While statehood is the ultimate goal, I have also worked hard in Congress to expand D.C. self-government, governing powers. For most of D.C.'s history, it did not have a locally elected government. In 1973, Congress passed and President Nixon signed into law the District of Columbia Home Rule Act, which established an executive chief, an elected chief executive and legislature for the district, and gave D.C. the authority to legislate on local matters, though with some exceptions. Under the Home Rule Act, passed by Bills passed by the D.C. Council are subject to a congressional review period before they can take effect. The president appoints D.C. local judges subject to the Senate confirmation. And D.C. Council is prohibited from amending the portion of the D.C. Code dealing with the courts. The U.S. Attorney for the District pro uh, prosecutes most local crimes committed by adults. Uh, the president exercises clemency, uh, clemency authority for D.C. crimes. The president controls the D.C. guard, and D.C. can't tax non-resident income. Even after passage uh, of the Home Rule Act, Congress can and does interfere in D.C.'s local affairs, including overturning laws. Twenty Republicans. And it is only Republicans these days have introduced 30 bills or amendments so far this Congress to impose, repeal, or block D.C. policies. Bills and amendments have been introduced on guns, vaccines, school curriculum, child care, elections, traffic enforcement, law enforcement, abortion, speed limits, street names, and commercial sex work. I have defeated each and every one. <laughs> this Congress, Republicans have gone so far as to even threaten to repeal the D.C. Home Rule Act and to return to the days when Congress was the sole legislature for the District of Columbia. For example, a dozen House Republicans sent a letter calling for hearings on repealing the Home Rule Act if D.C. didn't repeal its COVID-19 vaccine mandate for students. Congressman Andrew Clyde from Georgia has said that he will introduce legislation to repeal the Home Rule Act, and even Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy has said Congress will increase its interference in D.C. local affairs next Congress. Just let them try. <laughs> Congress's interference 
in DC's affairs have caused real harm to residents. In 2007, I, I finally was able to remove a dangerous appropriation rider that had prohibited DC from spending its local funds on needle exchange programs. The rider led to DC having one of the highest HIV AIDS rates in the country. The number of diagnosed HIV cases attributable to injection drug use decreased from 150 in 2007 to just two in 2019 after I was able to get that bill. I am working to remove two DC riders from appropriation laws that are still currently in effect. One prohibits the district for spending its own local funds on providing abortion services for low-income women. And the other prohibits DC from commercializing recreational marijuana. I would note regarding the marijuana rider, the rider was intended to overturn DC's 2014 referendum, legalizing adult use of marijuana. However, I was successful in arguing that the rider did not overturn the referendum itself, but only prohibits DC from further legalizing marijuana, which means DC can't legalize the sale of adult use marijuana. In other words, adult use marijuana is legal, but DC can't tax or regulate it. Members of Congress often use DC to score political points on issues they otherwise might, might not be able to fo focus on <coughs> excuse me, in Congress because they are matters limited to states or members want to appeal to special interest groups or industries. In 2016, a senator who was considering running for president had a B plus rating from the National Rifle Association. He then introduced a bill to eliminate most of DC's local gun violence pre prevention laws. After he introduced the bill, his rating from the NRA jumped from B plus to an A, just in time for him to run for president. I defeated the bill. <laughs> Another member of Congress, who is also responsible for the marijuana rider, offered an amendment that would have blocked DC from spending its local funds to carry out a new law, what was a then new law, regulating the labeling of wet wipes or flush as flushable or not. Now you often wonder, why do they care <laughs> about that in somebody else's district? A minor issue like that. DC determined that wet wipes should be labeled as a way or, or, or as, as to whether or not they were flushable. Since U US utilities spent more than 500 million to a billion dollars per year addressing clogs and other problems caused by flushing of wet wipes. This representative introduced this amendment after much lobbying by the industry, which would have been financially hit by the DC rule because it would have required companies essentially to make two types of packaging for their products. One for DC with a label saying that if their wet wipes were flushable or not, and the other labeling for the rest of the country without that designation, and could have led to other jurisdictions adopting the same law. I defeated that ridiculous rider also. <laughs> I have introduced 20 uh, bills, which I call my free and equal DC series of bills to expand DC self-government and in, to ensure DC is treated equally. Last month, the House Committee on Oversight and Reform passed my District of Columbia Home Rule Expansion Act, and that's not statehood, but it would be the biggest expansion of DC Home Rule since passage of the DC Home Rule Act in 1973. The bill would give DC exclusive authority to prosecute DC crimes, a very important issue, give DC the exclusive authority to grant clemency 
for DC crimes and eliminates the Congressional Review Period for DC legislation. This Congress, the House has also twice passed my bill that would give the DC mayor control over the DC National Guard. The mayor of the district should have the same authority of the National Guard that the governors of the states and territories have over their national boards. Each governor, including the governors of the three U.S. territories, and, uh, including the governors of the three U.S. territories with national boards, have the same authority to deploy the national guard to protect his or her state or territory, just as local militia did historically. The events at the U.S. Capitol on January 6, 2021, and the events at Lafayette Square by then President Trump on June 1, 2020, are prime examples of why that bill is so important. If it makes sense that governors have control over their national boards, it makes equal sense that the mayor of the district have a with a population the size of a small state have the same authority. The House also has, at my request, twice passed bills that would prohibit the use of federal funds to carry out the provision of the Home Rule Act that authorizes the president to federalize the D.C. Police Department. We also have to fight to ensure that D.C. is treated as a state for purposes of federal funding. Since D.C. residents pay the same federal uh, taxes as state residents, when Congress passed the coronavirus relief bill, the then Republican-led Senate treated D.C. as a territory instead of a state for fiscal relief, shortchanging D.C. $75 million. D.C. Republicans did that deliberately, it took us getting a new president and Senate for me to retroactively secure that $755 million for the district. The only way to ensure that DC has voting rights and full self-government and is treated the same may, matter as other states for federal funding is statehood. Again, I'm honored to have had the privilege to speak to you today. Thank you again. Put your hand together for a real chance. <laughs> 